everyone. Um, thank you for joining us um, for this session on Disability Dis Dissonance and Resistance, a Musical Dialogue. Um, our speaker today is uh, Professor Alicia Carlson with Providence College. Um, just a little bit about her. Her areas of expertise are philosophy of disability, biomedical ethics, 20th century continental philosophy, philosophy of music, and feminist philosophy. Um, and she will be um, speaking with us about um, music and um, disability. Um, if Lisha, you'd like to go ahead and take it away or? Sure, great. Yeah. Can, can, I, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, wonderful. So first of all, I wanna thank Dr. Munn for sharing this session, um, Joe and Shelley for putting on this amazing conference and all of the incredible participants who have presented their work and asked such compelling questions during these past three days. I've learned so much um, and I'm especially grateful for Joe's talk, which uh, we just heard because I think there are fascinating intersections between music therapy, disability studies, philosophy of music and philosophies of disability. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to outline some connections or imagine a dialogue between philosophies of music and philosophies of disability. Um, oh, and before I start, I should just um, identify myself. So I am sitting here wearing a colorful scarf and a black shirt um, with plants and a bookshelf behind me. Um, I'm a white woman. I, go by she, her, and I have gray hair. And I, since we're telling our age, I'm 51. Um, and I am a non-disabled person. I identify in that way. Um, and so I recognize um, all of the privileges that come with being a non-disabled philosopher. And that's why um, I'm really honored and humbled to be here um, as part of this conversation. Um, so I'd like to start by acknowledging that when I talk about philosophies of disability and philosophies of music, um, I'm speaking about them in the plural, because as we know, there isn't just a single philosophy of disability, nor is there a single philosophy of music. Um, so I'd like to start by setting the stage with four broad observations. Um, and that's what's on the screen. The first is that philosophers of cognitive disability have paid relatively little attention to the musical lives of disabled people. And there are some exceptions here. Um, secondly, philosophers of music seem to have paid relatively little attention to disability. Third, there is extensive work in disability studies and critical disability studies on disability culture, disability and the arts, performance studies, disability aesthetics, and disability and music in particular. So my overall argument today is really just to, to say that there is room for philosophers to engage more fully in these conversations. And then finally, I want to recognize that disabled musicians, composers, musicologists, scholars, and performers are having a profound transformative effect on both scholarship and on the lived experience of music. So before I begin, I want to give a brief sense of how I got here. I don't mean physically because I've been sitting in this chair since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but I've played the violin for most of my life. And for a very long time, I kept my musical and philosophical lives very separate. Um, but after spending a lot of my philosophical career critiquing how philosophers talk about intellectual disability, um, primarily in moral philosophy and in bioethics, I became interested in the philosophical significance of the musical lives of people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities. And I was struck by the fact that while there is a lot on this topic in other fields, 
So music therapy, music education and special education, um, music psychology. I found very little in philosophies of disability and in philosophies of music. So I've spent a number of years now working at the intersection of these areas. And I just finished um, at long last a book on this topic, um, which is called Shared Musical Lives, which is on the screen, um, Philosophy, Disability, and the Power of Sonification. So I, I just wanna really briefly mention what I argue in this book as this talk is kind of picking up on some of these arguments and extending them. So in the book, I argue that musical experience, and I, I, I construe music in the broadest possible way, can have both epistemic and ethical significance in that it can reveal dimensions of ourselves and others that may otherwise go unrecognized. And I also argue that attention to shared musical lives, both in formal and informal ways, can be transformative of relationships and expand our moral imagination and cultivate certain kinds of virtues. And the term sonification is a kind of organizing principle that I borrowed from work in science and technology. So the definition of sonification is simply the translation of data into audible sounds or notes. And I first encountered this concept at a conference on music and cognition where researchers had set EEGs um, to musical tones in order to better hear um, the EEGs of people who had epilepsy. And what they found was that it was actually easier to hear the moment before someone had a seizure as opposed to seeing it or reading it on the EEG. So I transpose this idea of sonification in the book and talk about it in a philosophical context and talk about how musical experience can sonify certain dimensions of ourselves and our relationships. And I'm happy to talk more about that um, in the Q&A. So the outline of my talk is as follows. Um, I will start by identifying some dissonances and prototypical figures when we think about music and disability. Um, and then the main arguments will be urging philosophers of disability to consider music and conversely, philosophers of music to consider disability. And then I'll end with some ideas about resistance and find some resonances between philosophies of disability and philosophies of music. So I first want to begin um, by acknowledging ways in which disability and music and, and art can strike some as dissonant. So in her wonderful book, More Than Meets the Eye, What Blindness Brings to Art, Georgina Klieg talks about the dissonance people experience when they are confronted with the idea of a blind visual artist or a blind museum goer. Blind painter can seem as strange to some as deaf musician. And yet as Georgina Klieg and deaf artists and musicians like the Scottish percussionist Eveline Glennie have shown, neither blindness nor deafness precludes engaging in these various art forms. At the same time, there are also familiar tropes or prototypes that wed rather than separate disability and the arts. So, in the context of cognitive disability or intellectual disabilities, the musical savant is perhaps the most well known. Um, and here, musicologist and disability scholar Joe Strauss has extensively critiqued this notion of the musical savant. Um, and he argues it's important to recognize these individuals in what he calls a realistic mode, which he borrows from Rosemary Garland Thompson, um, rather than in freaking them. So he says, quote, people who have been labeled as savants are not otherworldly super crips or bizarre freaks, 
Rather, they are people who, like the rest of us, are good at some things and not so good at others." End quote. And I just want to point out that there's also this narrative of the tragic or overcoming artists. So we can think of, you know, deaf Beethoven or blind Monet um, and the way in which we see underlying assumptions about both disability and the nature of art and artistic practice. So what would it mean for us to crip the philosophy of music? What can philosophy of disability contribute to philosophies of music? So here are some preliminary questions. First, where do we find examples of ableist discourse, assumptions, and practices within the philosophy of music? Where, how, and why is disability present or absent in philosophical work on music? Third, how can disability studies and philosophies of disability work in philosophies of music? And finally, what distinct contributions can disabled artists, philosophers make? And here I just want to acknowledge, I was really struck by Maeve O'Donovan's um, characterization of her relationship to art and the ways in which her experience as an artist um, point to creative and generative dimensions of experience that she did not find or does not find in certain forms of philosophizing. So I wanna briefly give a few examples of where we might engage disability in philosophies of music. So the first is to identify how certain musical normates, and I borrow that term from Rosemary Garland Thompson, how they work within arguments in philosophies of music. So what ways are there assumptions built into how performers or listeners or composers are defined within the philosophy of music? And these examples can be found in a broad range of areas within the philosophy of music. We find them in work on music and the emotions. So for example, um, you'll find references in some work like Jennifer Robinson's work um, on music and the emotions where she talks about the qualified listener or normal folks. Um, it's we see examples in the literature on music and cognition or language. And so I think we can ask, how does cognitive ableism function to define these notions? Notions of musical intelligence, musical understanding, and also how is the definition of musical bodies or embodiment normalized? within the philosophy of music. To speak to this question of embodiment and performativity and identity, I think we can also ask what connections can be drawn between theories in disability theory and philosophy of music. So in other words, there are a lot of interesting philosophers of music who take a phenomenological approach, who take various approaches to, um, to embodiment. And one example of that is the late philosopher violinist Naomi Cummings. Um, she wrote a book called The Sonic Self, in which she talks about how she has a unique embodied relationship to her violin and to the surrounding space in which she plays it. She says, quote, in the process of changing my relationship to space, I discover a new possibility of self, a new construction of my embodied position. No one can know what it is like to experience my particular body working with my particular violin in this particular space unless I give my own first person report. So though she doesn't address disability explicitly, 
this is a really rich area of exploration that many disability studies scholars have explored. So for example, Blake Howe defines what he calls disabledist music. He says, disabledist music is a musical practice that rejects the normal performance body and instead molds its performance practices around the impairments of its performers. Rather than concealing or silencing a disability, disabledist music audibilizes disability, asserts disability, even claims disability as a fundamental component of its sonic identity. So I think we can also add to the normal body, the idea of body minds, right? So we can talk about this not just in terms of physical um, disabilities, but also cognitive intellectual disabilities. And so this raises a broader question about how there might be fruitful generative cross-pollination between disability studies and philosophies of disability and the ways in which philosophers of music are exploring questions of embodiment. Another example that I recently came across, and I have not, I have to confess, I haven't had time to read the whole book, um, is a book by Peter Zendi, who's a philosopher and musicologist. And the title itself shows that he's engaging with the language of disability. The, the title of the book is Phantom Limbs and Musical Bodies. And I, I found this book as I was looking for literature on the significance of musical instruments. Um, and what's interesting in this book is the way in which he uses language and concepts from disability. So this raises another question, and that is how does disability appear, maybe not in a literal sense, but as a kind of metaphor or a narrative prosthetic, to borrow the term from Mitchell and Snyder, to aid in philosophical explorations of music? So how does the language of disability infuse philosophies of music? Another arena that I think is really rich for exploration is the connection between musical time and crip time. So what is the relationship between them? How can taking disability and crip time into consideration challenge and enhance theories of musical time? So for example, in the phenomenological tradition, um, there are philosophers like Edmund Husserl, um, Bergson, who will talk about the idea of musical time. And contemporary philosophers of music have also written on this. So what would it mean to think about crip time in this context? And in another way, how might crip time change discourses in music or in philosophy of music about musical performance, about virtuosity. And again, there is amazing work being done within um, the field of disability studies and musicology and music theory on some of these questions. So now I'd like to reverse things um, and consider the converse, which is what can philosophies of disability gain from turning to the arts and engaging in a dialogue with philosophers of music? So first, and this is something that I argue in my book that I'm hoping to expand upon in this paper, um, I think there is tremendous epistemic value in considering musical lives. And I wanna just say that I'm not arguing for a kind of musical exceptionalism. So I think a lot of what I'm saying can apply in both similar and different ways to other art forms. I happen to be speaking about music in part because of my own um, interest and in exploring my own musical life, but certainly I don't wanna restrict these broad questions to music as the only art form in which this is relevant. Um, so how can it have epistemic value? Well, specifically, I think considering music can introduce new forms of flourishing 
new modes of cognition or emotional engagement. Um, and so, whereas by using other measures, whether we're talking about IQ tests or talking about, you know, linguistic prowess, um, thinking about the ways in which, in the context of intellectual disability, the musical lives of people um, can really reveal certain dimensions of themselves that can have epistemic value for philosophers of disability. Um, there are alternate modes of performing identity when one thinks about identity and body minds in the context of music, whether it be as a listener, or I like the term witness, musical witness, because it doesn't center it on hearing per se, um, or as a composer, as a performer, um, as a musician. I think there's also ethical and political value in considering the relevance of music and the aesthetic experience in philosophies of music. So one of the things that these epistemic um, ideas can point to is the need to revise some of our definitions or conceptions of flourishing. Um, it can also problematize certain ableist dualisms. So the distinction between normal and abnormal or active and passive. It allows us to reimagine certain kinds of relationships. Um, and here, I, again, I want to re refer back to, to Joe's talk. I think one of the interesting questions is what, and I, I, my Wi-Fi cut out, so I apologize if you spoke to this in the Q&A, um, is to think about the power dynamics in certain types of musical relationships, um, like the music therapist. Um, and one thing I argue in my book is that I think there are ways to think about and conceive of shared musical experience outside of the therapeutic setting. And that's not to diminish um, the value of the therapeutic. Um, and then finally, I think there are ways to interrogate sites and forms of musical production as well. So where does music happen? Um, how does it happen? The final point I'd like to make has to do with language and metaphors. And so I think that there are, though I began with some problematic dissonances, um, I think dissonance in music, and I would argue in disability and in life more broadly, need not be a negative concept. In fact, it's very generative, it's productive, um, just as silence is. And silence and dissonance are core experiences and um, concepts within music. And I think philosophers of disability might find ways to expand our lexicon, our ways of talking about disability and the experience of disability by borrowing from this musical lexicon. So if we think about terms like counterpoint, harmony, resonance, syncopation, and improvisation. I think all of these terms um, might be able to find a home in philosophies of disability. So to conclude, I just want to point out now some resonances between philosophies of disability and philosophies of music. So I've talked about how they can sort of these fields can mutually benefit from a kind of critical dialogue. Um, but I've also been struck as I've been working in these two areas um, by some of the parallels. And so I hope these don't seem too forced um, and I'd love to talk about them more in the Q&A, but I think they're interesting to consider. So while critiques of essentialism, autonomy and the epistemic authority of science are likely very familiar to those here who work on disability. Um, there are also philosophers of music who are making similar arguments, but in a musical context. So for example, in the philosophy of music, the ontological 
status of the musical work. So what is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? You know, or what is um, Take Five? A musical work, is it a freestanding thing in the world? Um, so this question has been the topic of debate within philosophies of music. And some philosophers of music want to resist essentializing the musical work. So for example, Philip Alperson, who is a philosopher of music, writes in his article, Voices from the Margins, and I'll quote here at some length. He says, musical works are not natural kinds, but rather human productive activities fraught with intentional meaning, contextual pressures, enabling conditions and forces, and the accretions of history. We might compare our understanding of musical works with our understanding of human illnesses. Illnesses, of course, have underlying physiological conditions, but the full human meaning of illness in the context of human affairs can only be fully understood in the context of the complexities of lived human experience. Um, this is one of the only places I've seen a, um, a philosopher of music sort of overtly draw some connections with, in this case, the, the concept of illness as a kind of analogy. Um, and it's something I think is worth exploring further. Um, similarly, there are philosophers of music who are critical of the way the concept of autonomy, again, in, in this context, in relation to music, the way autonomy kind of governs uh, philosophical conversations about music. So one philosopher of music, um, Aaron Ridley, actually imports the language of pathology and talks about what he calls autonomania as this kind of obsession within philosophy of music to treat music as pure sound, as autonomous rather than something that is grounded in the social, historical, and material. Um, and again, I think there are, there are multiple layers of exploration here. One is just the, the parallels between these critiques, but then the second is the ways that in making these critiques, um, Ridley, for example, uses the language of disability um, to make the critique. A third shared commitment, I think, between philosophies of music and philosophies of disability is, is really the necessity in some ways to engage with scientific discourse. Um, so we're very familiar or maybe familiar with the critiques of the medical model of disability, um, a rehabilitation or a therapeutic model that aims to cure or normalize disability. Um, but there are also intersections in the philosophy of music with certain scientific um, fields, most prominently in the field of music cognition and music in the brain. Um, so I think there's a parallel here between um, philosophies of disability and philosophies of music in that both are engaged in what I call the dual task of both engaging with and problematizing, um, in some cases, the, the epistemic authority um, of certain forms of scientific discourse. Um, so in addition to research on music and cognition, um, Oliver Sacks has a book called Musicophilia, where he gives his, his kind of clinical portraits of various people um, with various, um, in some cases, musical pathologies, um, conditions that affect music. And so I think there, again, is fertile terrain here um, to explore the ways in which these critiques 
of science, but also engagement in productive ways with scientific literature or medical literature um, is happening in both the philosophy of music and philosophies of disability. And then a final resonance, I would say, um, comes up in the context of research ethics. So I think we can ask, how do ableist norms shape research on music and cognition? And specifically, what does it mean for people with disabilities to be either included in research on music and the brain, for example, or excluded from it. And this is something I think um, there's a lot to say about this and I'll just because of time constraints, it looks like I have two about two minutes left. Um, I'll save this for the Q&A, but I think there are a lot of important questions to ask about research on music um, and disability and what it means to do this research in, in ethical ways. So I just want to conclude by identifying a few forms of resistance um, and, and disability justice in the context of music. Um, so Helen Mikosha has argued for a paradigm shift in disability studies or disability theories. Um, she says that disability studies has been a predominantly northern academic endeavor that has failed to account for the experiences, practices, voices, and forms of knowledge produced in the global south. So she calls for a process of intellectual decolonization of disability theory. And I think given the vast work in music and ethnomusicology and music um, philosophies of, of music that engage with questions of cross-cultural and global um, musical production, we can ask how can critical disability studies and post-colonial philosophies inform philosophical work on music? And I think there are also ways in which it can go the other direction. So we might ask, what does it mean to decolonize disability and music together? So I have... Um, a couple of final slides. How am I doing on time? Should I wrap it up? Um, it's 937. The session goes till 955. So um, I think if you want to take a few more minutes, that, that should be fine. Okay. I'll just very, <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I'll take, oh, there goes my alarm. So yes. Um, I'll just, I'll just point to a few directions um, where we can find examples of musical resistance and forms of disability justice. Um, so first of all, I think picking up on um, Joe Stramondo's wonderful talk uh, about counter stories, um, we can think about where do we find kind of musical or artistic counter stories that challenge the master narratives about art and disability. Um, where is there room for disabled philosophers of music or disabled philosophers working in aesthetics? How do the contours um, and the boundaries of that discipline, that subdiscipline in philosophy, um, contribute to forms of, of exclusion? Um, I think music as a form of political resistance and protest, um, there are very powerful examples of this, in the, in, again, by disabled musicians, disabled composers. Um, and I also think it's important to ask questions about musical harm. So um, one of the things that I don't want to argue is for an overly romanticized view of musical experience, that music is going to solve all of our problems. And, and one point on this, I think, is um, work that's being done on the ways that music is weaponized. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that music can also be a form of harm. So in conclusion, I think one of the central questions, and, and Joe's talk spoke to this as well, is how do people have access to music? Um, where, where do people find ways to access music? And what kinds of musical spaces 
Do we inhabit? Are they inclusive? Um, what kinds of alternative forms of musical production are possible? Um, adaptive instruments, for example, or the use of technology? Um, and what would it mean to really refashion the way we think about musical spaces and musical connection? So I'll end there and I really look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you so much. Great. Yay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Coughlin. So um, as we wait for questions to come in, I actually have a question of my own. Actually, I have several questions, but um, I'm going to start with one. Um, so I think as a philosopher of motion, I feel like I kind of have to ask this question. Um, I think it's a really, really great in terms of your um, efforts to have philosophers of disability and philosophers of uh, music engage each other. Um, and especially with the hopes of like decolonizing and I'll say, I, also, I will also say like deprivileging the philosophy of music. Um, and I would like to kind of encourage efforts of uh, philosophers of emotion to also connect with philosophy of disability and philosophy of music to make their own contributions to the discourse as well. And um, you mentioned this view uh, or the notion of sonification. And if you could first, I didn't quite catch your new book, the title of your new book. So if you could tell us that, um, and then tell us a little bit about your notion of sonification and, and perhaps um, with some insights as to how this might, that notion might help um, philosophers of motion perhaps find um, intersecting um, topics or areas of engagement with philosophy of music and philosophy of disability. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so first of all, I just want to acknowledge um, that when I started delving into philosophy of music, I mean, there's a whole arena dealing with music and emotions. And I think, um, you know, philosophers of emotion have have so much to contribute in that in that dialogue. So I thank you um, for pointing that out. Um, so the title of my book is uh, Shared Musical Lives colon, because we always have to have these subtitles in philosophy, um, philosophy, disability, and the power of sonification. Um, so to say a bit more about this idea of sonification, um, I think it's, for me, the power of that notion is not in the fact that it's an oral, A-U-R-A-L, concept, right? And in fact, that's one thing that I try to, to address in the book, that I don't choose it because it's it's overtly based on sound and hearing. But the power of that concept, in my view, is the idea of translation and sort of the, the notion that if we find alternate modes of whether it be expression, communication, performing ourselves, our identities, that certain dimensions may appear or may be revealed that would otherwise have been either hidden or um, gone unnoticed. And so um, I think that in the context of philosophy of emotion, um, one, of the, one of the important contributions of um, disabled philosophers and theorists um, and artists has been to really give voice to their musical, emotional lives. So for example, there's a book on music and autism, which is a series of interviews with people um, who identify as having autism and they talk about the role that music plays in their lives. And in many cases, um, their examples are grounded in the way in which music speaks to their emotional lives. Um, and in that respect, a lot of, um, a lot of the examples really ch overtly challenge um, certain arguments or assumptions about, for example, um, autism, right? And the idea of, you know, the sort of absence of theory of mind um, arguments that, that define autism in certain ways. And it's, it, it, it's not to say that in speaking about music, that's the only way 
um, to bring some of these alternate modes of emotional experience or cognition into relief, but I think it can be a very powerful way. So for me, this idea of translation is just really more, more basically the idea of, you know, switching a kind of paradigm or a way of investigating something. Um, and I think it, it has echoes with even the experience of synesthesia, right? The ways in which going back to the, the time that I first encountered it, this, this notion that if you listen to an EEG, you may actually detect elements there that um, one couldn't see visually by looking at it. So I hope that answers your, your question. Well, I just have one clarificatory question. So I'm, I'm trying to still grasp exactly what you might mean by sonification, just to, just to get an idea of how that notion can, you know, play in um, research on emotions, music, and disability. So can you tell us, like, tell me a little bit about what, what sonification means in the way that you're using it? Sure. So, um, so one of the, one of the chapters in my book talks about the ways in which reflecting on musical experience can reveal certain dimensions of our experience of ourselves. So for example, our experience of time, the way in which I'm embodied. Um, so it can, it can generate certain um, forms of knowledge, forms of self-knowledge. Um, and, and highlight or, or emphasize dimensions of the self. Um, a second way in which it paying attention philosophically to, to musical experience um, is the way in which it can reveal certain dimensions of another individual's experience. And this is where um, my, my focus is primarily on intellectual disability and people with what are, are sometimes called profound intellectual disabilities. So whereas um, there may be assumptions about their capacities, whether it's their emotional lives or their cognitive or intellectual capacities, um, oftentimes there are examples where some of these um, abilities or dimensions of their, of their lives only emerge or often emerge in a musical context. Um, and so individuals who would not qualify as having certain capacities or characteristics um, actually um, these are sonified or are brought into the foreground um, when they engage in music. And this is not unique to, to, again, to music. So for example, think of someone like Judith Scott, um, the artist who did um, you know, sculptures that revealed a certain side, a, a, a dimension of her life, an expressive dimension um, that, again, would not have been um, recognized through other means. Um, and I guess the final thing I'll say is um, I talk about the way in which shared musical experience, um, the dynamics between performers, between audience and performer, um, between witnesses. So what does it mean to share in a concert with somebody else? All of those shared musical experiences can sonify or can bring out dimensions, ethical dimensions of our relationships to others. So I hope that makes it a little more concrete. I... Yeah, to a, to a certain extent. I'm, I'm excited about <laughs> reading your book though. Um, but for, let's, um, I'd like to move on to other people's questions just because I don't wanna um, take up all your time. Um, so Axel um, Barcelo Aspegia, sorry if I, if I messed up your name, um, also had a question. Uh, he asked, have you thought about how the concept of practice, even if you usually present it as the opposite of genius and talent, still perpetuates ableist prejudices? The concept of practice? Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah. So I'm going to read it one, once, once again. Uh, have you thought about how the concept of practice, even if usually presented as the opposite of genius and talent, still perpetuates ableist prejudices? So, so this is, I think, the idea of, of like 
you know, yeah. raw, like innate talent versus working up the developing talent. So thank you so much for that question. And I think, um, I have not thought about this, but I think it's, um, it's a fabulous question, um, in part because I think you're absolutely correct that we are, another dichotomy, I think, that, that is at play here is sort of the, 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 or a kind of hierarchy of talent and ability. And so I think the, you know, the mad genius or um, the creative genius is another prototype or another trope within within music and within art more broadly. And so um, I think to, to consider what kinds of demands um, are made when we talk about practicing an instrument, um, musical practice, um, I had not thought about that. And, and so I will definitely think, think more about that because I think it absolutely um, exposes certain ableist norms. I think it speaks to the idea of time and crypt time. And um, there's some amazing work being done um, by uh, Stefan Hanisch, who's a disability theorist and a pianist. Um, and he's doing work on the concept of virtuosity and disability. And so I think that connects as well. Um, but I think it also speaks even to the way that music music educators um, convey expectations. Um, what are the expectations of um, mastery of music or an instrument and how are those um, how are those ableist as well? So thank you so much for, for that question. Um, moving on, we also had uh, Shelly Tremaine had a question. Shelly, did you wanna? Yes, I, I do want to uh, direct this question at Leisha. Um, Leisha, um, that was a wonderful presentation. I love your work and I'm so happy that um, you're going to be um, writing a chapter for collection for Bloomsbury. Um, and uh, it also, so I guess I, I'd like to ask you um, to what extent and whether um, work that you did uh, in the faces of intellectual disability um, uh, is extended in, the, in your new book. Thank you, Shelley. Well, and thank you for this opportunity to be a part of the, this collection. Um, so I think that, I think in some ways, um, I view this work as an extension of of what I did in the faces of intellectual disability, but perhaps um, I think of it as taking a, a more positive turn. So whereas um, in the faces of intellectual disability, I would say my posture is primarily primarily a critical one rather than a kind of generative one to, to you know, critique um, the different faces of intellectual disability in philosophical discourse. Um, my work on music and disability is really trying to explore um, how engaging with philosophy of music and aesthetics um, can really provide the ground for new directions in philosophies of intellectual and cognitive disability. Um, and so I see it as um, sort of opening up new avenues that in some ways could provide an antidote to some of the, the problematic ways in which people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities are dehumanized in philosophical discourse. So, I mean, one thing I, I mention in the book is um, the idea of turning to musical lives and musical worlds um, of people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities, um, which is picking up on um, the, the structure of the book and Faces of Intellectual Disability, where I focus on kind of the historical or institutional world and the philosophical world of intellectual disability. And by that, I just mean those discourses about intellectual disability. So I see it as, as an expansion, um, but also taking a, a more generative 
creative turn, um, less about critique and more about finding ways to, um, to recognize the really rich, diverse um, lives of people with cognitive intellectual disabilities um, and, and respond to um, some of these critical arguments that I make in, um, in my book. So I hope that answers your, your question. Oh, well, we'll assume that it does. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Shelley. Um, thank you, Professor Carlson. So this was a wonderful talk. Um, you definitely gave me a lot to think about as well. Um, and I'm gonna just mention the title of your book one more time. It's um, Shared Musical Lives, Philosophy of Disability and the Power of Sonification. Um, we have unfortunately no more uh, time for additional questions, but um, I'm assuming that uh, people can email Professor Carlson um, if they like. Um, up next is the session on hip hop testimony and critical aesthetics of trauma theory. Um, so if you would all like to stay tuned, um, that would be great. Um, if not, I hope you have a great day. And thank you again to everybody and for these wonderful questions and this opportunity. Thanks. And the book's not out yet, so it will be oh. in the spring. Yeah, I should clarify that. Good so um, it doesn't exist until it appears on Amazon, right? Oh, thank you. So thanks so much for uh, another fabulous session. And congratulations to Shelley for theming the papers so well. And so we, we now have what sounds like a third music paper coming up.